Hello and welcome to Talk The Line. I'm Jen Long. On this podcast, I talk to some of our favourite people about the subjects that they are passionate about. And this week is the last in the series, the last in series one. It has been a very long series, uh, 73 episodes, but we are going to be switching things up for series two. We'll be back in the new year with more details. But for now, this is a very special one. We've been waiting ages to do. Jess Abbott is Tancred. She started her musical career as the guitarist in Now Now, but has since gone solo and just released her fourth record, Night Stand, on Hand in Hive and Polyvinyl. Her pop-punk indebted tales of heartache, break and everything in between are short bursts of infectious melody. But Jess is a massive Harry Potter fan. We have been saving this theme for her for nearly two years, and this makes a perfect end to the first series of Talk the Line. It's time to go deep on all things Hogwarts. A massive thanks to Jess. We will be back sometime in the new year. You have been listening to Talk the Line. I'm Jen Long. This is a podcast from the line of Best Fit, produced by Paul Bridgewater, with original music by Seams. We will not be uploading another episode for quite a while. Best thing to do is to follow us on social media for more news in the new year. Have a lovely Christmas. Thank you very much for listening. See you on the other side. Okay, so it's... Is it last night at the tour? Yes. Okay, Mm -hmm. so you're exhausted. Yeah, Yeah. it's probably not feeling in the chattiest of moods. But this is the pod... (laughs) This is the one Talk the Line podcast that I think we have been building up. Like, the one that's been in the, like, and we have to do this one. Like, been in our planner for, like, pretty much (laughs) since we started the podcast. It was like, who can we get to talk about what? And Jess has to talk about Harry Potter. It's true. And other people have tried to claim the subject. You know that, right? Well, it was I that got you to read Harry Potter, right? You like had an or like it was. It was. I mean, there was a few of you, but you were yes. one of the main protagonists. Yeah, it goes that way. I've gotten a lot of people to read Harry Potter that wouldn't have. I've gotten a lot of adults to read Harry Potter. <laughs> My view of Harry Potter was always. I think it came out while I was at university, and all I cared about was indie bands. And I didn't care about anything else. And so I was like, why the fuck would a grown adult read a children's book in public? (laughs) Did you wear, did you put like a a little fake jacket around your book when you would take it out to read it? No, because I read it like last year. And by then I was, I didn't care anymore. Right. Yeah. By then it was so accepted anyway. And so many adults have read it. I think most people who saw me reading it were like, yeah. They were like, oh, Jen's finally reading it. (laughs) The worst bit. And I think anyone who's listening, there's going to be spoilers in this podcast, right? I mean, at this point, if you don't know what happens, (laughs) where have you been? Were you kidnapped and held in a bunker for the last 20 years? So, like, I was working in this office and I was reading the books and the two girls sat opposite me loved Harry Potter. And they were like, oh, just wait till you get to that, all that bit. Have you got to that? Mm, She's not got to that bit yet, all that bit. And I was like, what bit, what bit? And then I got to that bit when I was on the tube. What was the bit? The bit where Dumbledore dies. Right. And I was on the tube and I had to like stop reading it three times because I was like, I'm going to cry in public. And then I got into, yeah. <laughs> into oh my the God. office and I was just sat at my computer and I was like trying really hard not to be emotional. And someone was like, you all right? And I was like, Dumbledore dies. <laughs> and she was like, what, what, what happened? And I was like, Dumbledore died. And she was like, oh my God, I actually thought someone like real had passed away in your life. Well, I mean, someone <laughs> real in your life did pass away. <laughs> okay, where did your passion for Harry Potter begin? Well, um, I was in first grade. I was like, so I must have been about six. And I was sitting on the playground and we had just had a book fair. And did, do you have book fairs here? I, th- I mean, it's been a long time since I was at school. But I do remember there was like... You would remember. There's like scholastic book fairs where like scholastic would come and lay out all these books and then your parents would give you money because you would know about it in advance. It would be like a book catalog and you'd show up with your little money and you would buy the books you want and it was like really fun. I feel like we had the catalog and I don't, I don't know whether they actually brought the books around. Maybe they did. Yeah, it might have been like you I order it. Yeah, I don't know so why they missed that marketing opportunity. It was that, and I think only the first one was out at that time. For it, this would have been like 96, 97. I don't know if the second one had come out yet. If it hadn't, it like was about to. And um, 
and my friend was reading it on the playground and I just sat next to her and I like really loved to read as a little kid I was like reading since I was like two and so I would just like sit next to my friends and read whatever they were reading and this girl was reading Harry Potter and I she was on like the first page and I read it and was like turn the page what's the next page and then like we read like a chapter at recess and then I was like mom buy me this book and then Mm -hmm. it was like I remember getting them for my birthday like every year when they would come out and then I started getting them at like premieres like the midnight premieres I would like wait outside in line how old were you um well uh I remember when the fifth book came out I was about to start I think seventh grade so I would have been like 12 and you your mom let you just stand out on the street not by myself like I would be like with like my friends or my friends and their parents or like my mom would be there all right as long as you were supervised of course (laughs) (laughs) yeah it was I've just like followed it along pretty religiously and you're like the right age right you you as in when you started reading it you would have been around the age that that book was meant to be kind of meant to be for young children and then she she wrote them to for kids to grow up with, yeah, right? I th- well, I think because they were a couple years older than me the whole time I was reading them, I think, until the seventh book. When that, when the final installment of the seventh book came out, I had caught up and we were the same age. But, but then you did just say that you were an accelerated reader, so. Well, I mean, I read them when they came out, like everyone else. I read them in like the first week that they were out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just meant you said you were like of a higher reading age because you've been reading for so long. Oh, so yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> did just me like fast yeah. but yeah well I feel like as I get older I get dumber and like my reading <laughs> level has definitely gone down <laughs> as I've aged <laughs> okay so you yeah so she did she she wrote wrote them with the intention that they would grow as the audience grew in in terms of like the subjects that they're dealing with right and the language used like there's mm-hmm. a few cuss words in those later books I think so, but they're like British cusses, so I like, they just, (laughs) I was like, this is just silly words. (laughs) But like also some of the like sexual undertones and things like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Dumbledore is definitely, we were talking about this in the the van the other day, that Dumbledore, (laughs) there's the whole thing where she said he was gay, like in retrospect, like she came out and said that after. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then, like, uh, because of, like, Grindelwald, like, they were having, like, they had been, like, lovers, and then they, that's why they had that ultimate duel, and then, um, and then people started reading into his relationship with Harry, which was, like, kind of annoying at first, because I was, like, Dumbledore was a mentor to Harry, and him being gay doesn't mean that he is preying on boys, but then I was, like, he did, like, invite Harry up to his office in, like, the middle of the night to, like, eat candy, <laughs> like, <laughs> weird shit like that, <laughs> but... Oh, no. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure everything's fine. Don't add that layer. Don't add that layer to it. (laughs) Yeah, and there was that weird sexual undertone about goats with with Dumbledore's family. There was, like, some weird thing about his brother. Goat? Yeah, like there was a weird goat <laughs> sex thing that was like you'd need to be an adult to register, but it was really? like I don't think I registered that. I, I think I mean now I'm questioning myself and <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna look it up because I'm gonna feel so weird if I just pulled that out of nowhere. <laughs> um, but like, do you not find it annoying that J.K. Rowling keeps saying things that the characters were like after the books have come out? Like, we should have just written it in the books. Oh if you yeah, want to be a part of the it's book. really annoying. Okay, yeah, I saw cool. a funny tweet that was like. It's, it was the format of, like, anyone, hello, and then it's, like, J.K. Rowling, um, uh, did you know that Hedwig was a Nigerian woman? <laughs> 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 yeah, it is, okay, uh, Aberforth Dumbledore, um, so Dumbledore's little brother, or older brother, I don't know, he was his brother, like, the the top thing is Reddit being, like, what is the thing with Aberforth Dumbledore and goats, dot, dot, dot. What is the thing with him I always goat? hated that so many people make it a sexual bestiality sort of reference. What's I mean, the reference? Find the reference. What's the original line? Um, let me see if it's here. Bestiality is heavily implied, especially those, quote, inappropriate charms. Yeah, he was doing inappropriate charms on goats. But even oh as a young boy, God. he had an unhealthy obsession for goats. From Dumbledore's notes and tales of Beetle the Bard, I heard it first from my mother, and it soon became the tale I requested more often than any other at bedtime. This frequently led to arguments with my younger brother, Aberforth, whose favorite story was Grum- Grumble the Grubby Goat. Um. <laughs> uh, then he kept throwing or chucking goat dung at 
his head when they were kids. Um, no, I think she just wrote that like, this is funny. Goats are a funny little animal. I think what are, what are inappropriate slant. charms on goats? What he is that? He might have just like made made it go chaotic or something. He might have like made it, you know, like bum switch with its face or something. Maybe. But why wouldn't they just say that? What would be it? <laughs> how would an inappropriate charm be a sexual one though? Oh my god, it was cemented into love by the fact that his most fond memories of childhood were feeding the goats with Ariana. They reference goats so many times with this character. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read it all in one place. He just you know, obviously, just likes goats. Yeah, it's like most people he does. are like cats. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're putting your peen in it. Oh my god! But I don't know. <laughs> That'll be in notes for my reread. <laughs> I'm I'm planning to watch all of them at Christmas time. Um, okay, yeah, right. So, where do you stand on the film adaptations? Um. Well, this came up the other day too in the van that they're kind of like cool van chat. I don't think it was even with the guys because i don't think anyone that plays in tankard right now even cares about harry potter i don't think they've like finished any of it um who was i talking about it with uh that the harry potter movie universe is different from the book universe like they're like you have to think of them as two separate things because like the movies are really good but there's so many things that are different like the my biggest pet peeve with the movies is Ginny because she was such a badass in the books and in the movies <laughs> it's like what's wrong with you it's like there's something wrong with you and it's like no in the book she's really cool I swear like she is the character that I feel like I identify most with and then or one of them and um in the movies I'm just like it's just a total flop but the movies get pretty sexual too with Ginny and Harry when oh there's like God, that Christmas scene when he, she like bends over to tie his shoe and you're like holy shit <laughs> Oh my god, these people are 15. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I like the movies. Um, they're, good, they're good Christmas watchings as well. Christmas and the kind of thing you put on when you're going to like fall asleep at night or something. It's like peaceful to fall asleep to those movies. How? Because it's just like really cozy and homey. <laughs> you wouldn't put on like the seventh one and fall asleep. You'd get nightmares for sure. Yeah, right? But like the first few are just like, they feel comforting. It's like mm-hmm. ASMR. I think that's just you. I, everybody does that. Well, I'm also thinking of Casey and Brad, and they do it like every night still, like years in. Maybe I'm just like basing this off a pool of very specific people <laughs> that do this. <laughs> okay. What do you think it is about J.K. Rowling's writing that made the bit books kind of su- such page turners? Because once you once you get sucked in, it is really hard to stop. Mm. I think that the universe that she created is just like something so like similar to ours but so different in a way that just like feels really good and like it the magical universe is like I feel like the kind of thing that any kid whether or not you've read Harry Potter in like your own imagination kind of conjures up this world that you want to live in or feel like you do live in and the books just like kind of bring you there in detail and it feels like it entertains just like so much of yourself so much of your own imagination that like it brings you to a place that you can't get to without it and it is a specific kind of universe that's like so relatable and similar to our own that anyone can kind of put themselves in it and like feel really good and um I don't know it's just like it's easy to fall into and um like the first two books are just like I was just saying about the movies they're just really like comforting and warm and um you know, Harry is a person that feels very alone his whole life until he realizes he's magical and um, and then finds this, like, place to be safe and be himself where people aren't going to, like, rough him up like he grew up having done. And, like, everyone can relate to that, to just feeling really lonely and wanting a place where you feel really good. And that's, like, what Harry's whole deal is in the first couple books. Do you think it's not also, like, the idea that you are actually special? Like, everyone kind of thinks, like, maybe I do have a special power. Yeah. You know, like, even though we're probably all incredibly dull, we're like, <laughs> but. Yeah. <laughs> still think there's, like, something special about me, actually? There's still a chance that I could be magical. <laughs> yeah. There's still a chance that, like, in two years' time, I will stare at that glass and be able to knock it over with my mind. It was definitely depressing to read the books um, being a little kid and then 
hit that age of 11 where you're supposed to have gotten your letter by and not having gotten the letter <laughs> and just being like, fuck, I'm a muggle. Come on, I'm a <laughs> fucking muggle. Jesus. <laughs> fucking muggle. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the imagination, the world that she created. Sometimes I think, like, how do you, when you're writing that, books that are that thick and long and there's, like, so much in them and there's so many of them, like, how do you even remember what, like, this fantasy world that you've created is how do you remember like the different names for spells or like weird like monster type yeah. things that exist like it must be so baffling to have that world in your head because like when you write about the real world it must be a bit easier because you're like well I know that trains go on tracks and I know that like 12 o'clock is like 12 o'clock and yeah that cats have four legs but then when you write about like a an imaginary world like a world that you've created yeah like she has to think of a way that these people transport themselves like where they don't just like drive cars around like port keys and stuff is yeah. such like a i remember being a little kid and reading about port keys and it taking me a second to like understand how that kind of stuff worked like what she was trying to explain like so they touched a boot and now they're in another place and like <laughs> as a little kid i was just kind of like Sure. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, thinking about it now in the context you're talking about, like she was like coming up with these genius ways for this world to function that none of it feels forced or like like a stretch. It, right. it all feels like a succinct place that she made up in her head. Yeah, it's like because it's based in the real world. It doesn't doesn't go too far out of the too far out of the realms of possibility that it feels implausible. It's like all this stuff could happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's really clever. Yep. Your Elsa's really clever. Hmm. How far in advance do you think she planned this storyline? Like, she can't have just been, like, writing it on the fly. Isn't that how she did it, though? Like, they were saying she, like, was working in a coffee shop and, like, had the idea, so she scribbled it on a napkin and, like, was, like, Harry Potter and then, like, the boy who lived and then she just, like, kept scribbling it on this napkin and that was just, like, how it started. It just, like, came to her. And I then... believe it was the Elephant Cafe in Edinburgh. <gasps> oh, so you know. The Elephant Room Cafe, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Have you seen the, like, I don't know if it was a special feature or, like, some kind of mini documentary feature thing on her that's, like, 45 minutes long. It's on the end of one of the DVDs um, or Blu-rays or whatever where she, like... DVDs! <laughs> okay, it was on DVD when I saw it <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> um, oh no, I need to go a bit more modern. Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know. Why do people watch it now? And I just tore into everything. Yeah, that's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, she goes, she, um, so they do, there's a couple of really great things about it. First, they take her to all the places that she grew up and she just walks around talking about them, like this old church she went to and they found the books where she like wrote her name when she was a little kid. And Wait, but where did she grow up? I, I don't remember. Because it wasn't part of it inspired by Exeter where she went to university. Okay, cool. I don't know. <laughs> I remember, you already paying this attention was like to when that, she uh, was <laughs> that bonus disc. Well, the parts I remember, they did like a lightning interview where they gave her like twenty questions, and they were like, "You need to answer like with one or just like a few words, like instantly." And her answers are like fucking insane. Like she has such a beautiful mind, and mm -hmm. it's like I, I don't know. It it was it I think helps um, you kind of like imagine her writing these books to just know like to see her in action, thinking of things, wow. and um, and then. Uh, then she goes to the place where she was living when she was like really poor and wrote the first book and she was just living there with her daughter as a single mom and the people that live in the apartment now let her in like they gave permission for them to go in and film her walking around I mean, it you would wouldn't you if someone was like hey um, so JK used to live here like is yeah. it alright if she just comes and has a little look around you'd be like holy shit yes yeah like oh she lived here when she was poor and wrote Harry Potter 1 what? First of all, that's insane. Second of all, yeah, she can come in my house. Third of all, maybe I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> Does she know I'm Harry Potter? <laughs> um, so she, they film her walking in, and she's going around and explaining like where the crib was and like where she like was where she used to write like what nook she used to write in, and then she turns over, she goes to like their bookshelf and sees all the Harry Potter books in a line. <gasps> oh my god, I like, got goosebumps even saying it, and she starts crying, and it's like oh, wow. fucked up. It's so good. But she must some of the little bits like she must have had a like she must have known how many books she was gonna write maybe like after the first one did so well she must have written down or like some you're gonna have like, seven yeah she seven must. is a magical number she, i mean it is though she yeah. must have written some kind of like story arc because it all fits together so well 
all the like horcruxes and yeah stuff like that like how soon did she know how it was all gonna end snape oh my god i cried the hardest when snape died oh that was some fucked up shit did you ever like snape i hated him and then i read that scene and where he says always and i was an always sucker for like years and then i got older and was like okay snape actually was a bad person and just because he was in love with someone doesn't give him the right to treat a child like garbage also kind of creepy in love and he's creepy. Yeah, every now that I'm older, I don't like Snape anymore, but I still <laughs> With think With my that 2018 Me Too eyes, <laughs> it's a little bit creepy. I mean, no, not even that. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I don't have Me Too eyes, but... Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh but but I still think that even with him as a shitbag, him dying and, and looking in Harry's eyes to, like, remember this, like, one, like thing in his life that he felt love for is still like as a moment it's very more it's more like withering heights like Catherine and heathcliff like you hate them both but like they're but you still like mm. it, you still experience their emotions along with them in withering heights and it's like snape is a piece of shit but i'm still gonna cry every time i read the word always in that book oh. <laughs> <laughs> are you welling up now no. <laughs> no, but I did almost well up at JK crying. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like a favorite book? Um, hmm. Probably not a favorite book. I have favorite movies, but um, I think everyone kind of does with all the different directors and stuff. But I don't know, like they're all, all the books bring you to a different place. Um. I think the seventh book is like total genius, but it also feels like Nazis and I feel horrible and sad when I read it. So like, but it's so like brilliant. And then the third one, the universe of the third book is so cool. Um, and the movie was awesome. What's the third book called again? The Prisoner of Azkaban. I think that's my favorite one. That's, yeah, the one where the movie is really, like, dark and, yeah. like, kind of goth. It's, like, the one movie that's like that. And I bloody love Helena Bonham Carter. I oh, know my God, that you yeah. Can't, I know that we're not supposed to like her character, but she is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, there's the perfectly cast, like, Oh, yeah, perfect. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, so favorite movie? Yeah, that's my favorite movie. Same. Favorite book? I don't know. Then no. My, fr I have like all of the books on a shelf, and I, I am one of those like crazy people that keeps all my stuff in like really pristine condition. And um, but the first book I've had since I was six, and it's like the jacket's gone. The whole book is like tattered and water stained, and the pages are yellowed, and they're all dog-eared. It's the only book on the shelf that's just like beat to shit, and. Um, <laughs> So it's like the most basic book, and it always feels like one you just have to get through when you reread it, but it's also, like, special. So, I don't know. They're all great. What do you think about those books attracted such a wide audience? Like, because they are kids' books. There's not many kids' books that have reached so many people, but also in such a, like, powerful way. Like, when you think of other things that are similar to it, like, I don't know, like, we have done we did a podcast with um, Emily from the Staves, about the His Dark Materials trilogy mm. by Philip Pullman um, and a bit about uh, Lord of the Rings and mm. uh, Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, like the Chronicles classics. of Narnia, stuff like that. I feel like, you know, people, some people love those books, but I don't feel like as a set, like as a whole body of work, they reach people in the same way that Harry Potter does. Like all people don't just like one book from the Harry Potter yeah. series, you know? People don't like people just, you know, most people just like Northern Lights, don't they? From the His Dark Materials trilogy. Well, but and like, His Dark Materials gets like overtly religious in a way oh that you God. feel one way or the other about it, or like you have the capacity to, people can have that capacity to. So, but like with Harry Potter, they don't really talk about that. And I think that there are areas where it's implied and there's a lot of like imagery or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, like you can, you can just like, you can create what you want in the Harry Potter universe. You can feel different ways about what's happening and kind of like project yourself into different places when it um whereas I feel like a lot of those other books it's like pretty straightforward you know like his dark materials is about killing god more or less um uh and uh chronicles of narnia are about they're also very religious right <laughs> <laughs> don't eat too much candy or something <laughs> 
Um, Lord of the Rings just feels like classic fantasy. Like yeah. that's just it's removed from our world. That's a classic fantasy escapism. Like mm. whereas Harry Potter is it's modern, but um, it also has something like timeless about it, and they don't address anything like. I guess it does get kind of political with like the Ministry of Magic when they're kind of like ignoring the reality of Voldemort coming back and, and that Umbridge. speaks to a lot of realities. Oh, and Umbridge. Oh my god, Umbridge. Yeah. Oh, who's played so brilliantly in the films. Is yeah, it geez. Melda Staunton? Who I plays? don't know her name. I, I should. Be. I'm sorry. If I'm sorry to you if you are telepathically registering <laughs> that someone is just yeah. shitting all over you right now. <laughs> So good. Oh my god. Yeah, that she's kind perfect. Char- she's really good at making bad characters, isn't she? Mm-hmm. She's really good at making characters that you love and she's really good at making characters that you hate. Really the whole movie, the whole franchise is well cast except for Ginny. Like <laughs> why did why could they not find a tough, brassy, badass, tough girl and ugh, I don't know what the ugh, I'm just mad about it. I'm just, I'm always going to be mad about it. And there also was a weird scene where they burn the Weasley house down in, mm. I think it's the sixth movie. The, it's either the fourth or the sixth. Um, where it's eight it, films, right? Yeah. Was it the seventh movie? No, I think it was, or was it? I think it was the sixth or seventh. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, yeah, with the, the really d- bad CGI. Yeah, they just like set the whole Weasley house on fire. And then it. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, does it just like regenerate because that house is still there throughout the it's in the next movie like <laughs> what were we supposed to take from that was it just supposed to be dramatic but like not a big deal because they can just like rebuild their house with magic or what like it was just such a strange call I did to not make register that it was it did not happen in the books and it made no sense in the movies i was just like i think i saw that i saw all the movies at midnight and um, when that one happened, the whole theater was like, what? Like, out loud? Like, really? What, what do you mean? Like, buddy dorks. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wh- oh, dorks? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> oh, do you have, like, any favorite things? Like, I don't know, the, um, like, the banqueting hall or Hogwarts Quidditch, like, the sweet shop? Or the, the the like joke shop that the twins like all these like mad things. You have like a favorite bit in Harry Potter that you're like, oh, fuck, I wish that was real. Oh man, favorite bit. I think that I'm um I'm like a Hermione nerd. I just like I would be so excited to study and make notes and practice new stuff. Just like that, going to school would have been my favorite part of the whole thing. Like. I wouldn't have no time for a joke shop. Like, I would be like, let's hit the books. Give me my quill and my big you know empty that journal. You can just learn things and go to school as a muggle. Like, that, you, I that's do. That's still I an spent, option. I have my own study notebooks <laughs> for my own recreational studies at home. I am a nerd, but I mean, imagine <laughs> if it was magic. Right. Imagine okay. if I was making potions and I can make shit float. Like, I mean, you could just study chemistry. You know, I actually skipped that class in school. <laughs> I've never taken a chemistry course. I mean, chemistry is basically potions. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know. I didn't take chemistry. No, but you might have been stuck with a Snape. <laughs> well, it was like in my school, that was the final science credit I needed. I could either take chemistry with everyone or I could take geology, which all the jocks took so they could pass. And I just didn't care about science. I cared about English and history, and I just had no time for science. So... I was like, I'm going to take geology with all the dumb asses. And um, it was very easy, but I actually learned quite a lot. It was a fantastic class. It was very Dead Poet Society, very hands-on. But um, Is that why you've gone into rock? <laughs> Are you going to drop your mic? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I've got one final question. Okay. What are you? It, like, what house am I? Oh, yeah. What do you think I am? You know me. <sighs> what do you think I am? It's such a Hufflepuff. First of all, I'm not a Hufflepuff hater, but I don't believe I am one, and I can't tell if you're trolling me or no, if you. No, so trolling me. <laughs> a Ravenclaw? Yes. Yeah, I think it's a Ravenclaw. <laughs> um, I always assume people would be able to pin what I am, and then when I say that, like, what do you think I am? I'm like, oh fuck! If they say Slytherin, I'm gonna start crying. 
<laughs> oh my god i've only ever been called a slytherin once and it was my ex-girlfriend <laughs> oh my god please tell me that was while you were breaking up um it was like I just, sorry i just can't be with you because you're just oh, so <laughs> no it was more like bitterly said after the breakup like <laughs> oh you're a slytherin you're definitely a slytherin like oh like that god. i was like fuck you i was like about a cadaver <laughs> i just killed her <laughs> Anyway, I'm a Ravenclaw. <laughs> uh, what, what, are the, what are the qualities of a Ravenclaw? Uh, they're just like bookish. They're nerds. They think about things before they make a decision, even if it's something where like, so like a Gryffindor would impulsively be like, I'm going to go save the day, which is like overall pretty good, like a good way to be. But there are times where it's just like the wrong move. It's just like fucking dumb. And I think Ravenclaw will like take a second to process if it's like, if it's necessary to interject and, um, and then whereas Slytherin is more like, you're on your own. <laughs> See you later. And I don't know what Hufflepuff's like. I, I am so distant from Hufflepuff <laughs> that I don't even know what their qualities are. But <laughs> Oh, okay. I feel like no one who's listening right now hasn't read Harry Potter or mm-hmm. all of them or been involved in the uh, Harry Potter universe. And usually yeah. when we finish these podcasts, we're like, so how can people find out more? Yeah, you know I mean? how can There's you find out more about Harry Potter? Yeah, Step yeah. Step outside your house. <laughs> Go to the fucking library. Uh, yeah. no, there's no need There's no need for that right now. But maybe you have like a nerdy tip for people who are fans. Like you know, maybe there's like a particular Harry Potter experience or like some kind of dorky website or film. Yeah, or actually, I've got you... a great tip okay, great. that I just learned this year. I learned last month. Um, okay, so I've been to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, um, and I, as of last month, have also been to the one in Hollywood, and the Hollywood one is so much smaller, there's so much less to do, there's like two rides, don't do it, if you're gonna make a trip to the States and go do Harry Potter stuff, go to Orlando, there's are like a million more rides, it's so much more fun, um, and they just added a bunch of like extensions onto it. And uh, that's my hot tip. That's my Harry Potter tip. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for talking to us. <laughs> Finally, we did the Harry Potter podcast. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I'm worried now that I've said some things that will trigger some people that people will disagree with me on so many <gasps> things. Oh, my God. I'm sure that there's going to be some Slytherins listening that are pretty pissed off. No, I think it's <laughs> fine. I think people like that, they just don't really tend to voice their opinion on the Internet, on social media platforms. I'm sure you'll be totally all right. Hopefully. A massive thanks to Jess. We will be back sometime in the new year. You have been listening to Talk The Line. I'm Jen Long. This is a podcast from the line of Best Fit, produced by Paul Bridgewater with original music by Seams. We will not be uploading another episode for quite a while. Best thing to do is to follow us on social media for more news in the new year. Have a lovely Christmas. Thank you very much for listening. See you on the other side.